every so often there comes a child prodigy. At seven, Ainan Kauli was accepted into Singapore's gifted education program. Born in 1999, he is now on an American degree program at a local private university. As he is shy with strangers, we, we let his father, Valentine Kauli, tell us his story. I mean, I remember the day he was born, actually. He was crying, as most babies do, and then I said a nickname for him. And he turned his head towards me, oriented on me, immediately stopped crying, and appeared to be looking at me. Which is very strange, because newborn babies are not meant to be able to orient on their environment, they're not meant to be responsive or anything. So from the moment he was born, he was much more alert than you could expect. Mm -hmm. um, by four months he was crawling, by six months he was walking, by eight months he was running, at eight months he started to show signs of reading, um, at eight months he could climb in, in and out of his cot. So, you know, you know a standard wooden cot by this high? He could climb up into it and, and back out again. So uh, he used to do that and run around the house and laugh at us and then climb back in again. So um, really very obvious very early on that there was something unusual going on. And when he was 12 months, um, Shader put a cape on his shoulders, a red cape, and said, look, Einan, now you're Superman. And he went, no, mummy, I'm not Superman. You see, I cannot fly. And then he jumped up in the air, came down again, and went, see? <laughs> now that's a full, a full sentence with a logical argument, proper grammar, no errors, um, and an experiment thrown in for good measure all at 12 months, when most kids haven't even said their first word or are struggling to say their first word. So very obvious from very early on that this was unusual. But the thing is, we were first-time parents, so we didn't quite know how unusual. It's only looking back that we see how unusual it was um, because we, we weren't really um, comparing with other parents at that time. But it was, even, even though we weren't comparing with other parents, it was obvious there was something unusual happening. The biggest challenge has always been to get an appropriate um, environment for him, like the right educational environment. Um, it took us 22 months to find uh, chemistry lab space for him so he could do practical chemistry classes from the time we started looking to the time we actually found it. So we started looking when he was six, we found it when he was eight years and four months. So a huge amount of wasted time. Um, so the, it's, it's been a real challenge to get the right environment for him. So he was at Singapore Polytechnic when and he was what, eight. And what happened? Why did he come back? To, why did he okay. come to Malaysia and study? Th there's quite a sad story behind that. When uh, he was at Singapore Polytechnic for a year and studying chemistry, mainly tertiary, uh, th third year courses, third year courses, mm -hmm. and um, his mentor there, who was the head of the chemistry department, um, had a brain operation for a tumor, I think. Um, Ung Kok Ching, mm -hmm. Dr. Ung Kok Ching, very nice mm -hmm. man, very sweet, very supportive, and he was Malaysian Chinese actually. And yeah, it's very sad. Um, he, he had a, an operation to remove a brain tumor, I think, and um, the operation went badly wrong. He, he was left in a coma. He never came out of the coma, and he died several months later. Yeah, he was the motive force behind Ireland's presence mm -hmm. at Singapore Poly. So that suddenly we were left without anywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, we thought, we, I, I was Googling actually, and I found the National Association of Gifted Children of Malaysia, and I contacted them. Uh, the president it was Zuhaira Ali, contacted them, and um, in a very short time, about a week of in initiating um, 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 a search for a, a university place for him in Malaysia, she had found two places which were willing to help, um, and um, we had a scholarship on the table. So we decided then there was time to leave. So we left Singapore and came to Malaysia. Ironing is on a university level, right? Yes. Do you think that do you think that it, it is too young for the age of Not 12? at all, not at all. Why not? In fact, because uh, if Einan speaks his thoughts on matters that are, are of his interest, for instance, mathematics or computer programming or science mm -hmm. in general, or even music, um, his thoughts are not really comprehensible to a smart adult. So his thought level is above that of a smart adult in the areas of his interest. So actually, university is not inappropriate. Yeah. In fact, if anything, it, in some ways, some, he, he would need more than that. Um, but that's the best thing we can do right now. Um, um, he has developed to the point in which only a very small fraction of smart adults can understand his thoughts when he actually talks about things of his interest. Mm -hmm. So how did you coach him when, when you realized that he was a child protégé? Well, the funny thing is that I did nothing 
for, <laughs> for a very long time. I'm, I'm ashamed to say it, but I didn't respond to him until he was six years old mm. uh, in that sort of way. Um, at three, he was surfing mathematics sites on the internet looking for hyperdimensional shapes, and he would draw the shadows of these shapes in two dimensions as a form of play. But I just I saw that, thought, oh, yeah, yeah, it's just Einan being Einan. But when he got to six, his aunt, Anissa, um, caught him reading a chemistry textbook uh, in her house. And, uh, it's an O-level chemistry series. O-level textbook. And she said, uh, Einan, you seem to understand that. And he said, I do. And he went, oh, yeah. And she got him an O-level chemistry. No, it's a 10-year series, yeah. so it's um, past exam papers. Past exam papers. So she got him to do one of the papers, and he, got the question, uh, question, he answered the questions correctly. So when I heard this, he was six and a half. When I heard this, um, that was the, the moment I decided I needed to respond. Yeah. So I, I bought him his own chemistry textbook, and we started studying chemistry together. Um, and six months later, I still remember the date, January the 18th, 2006, he passed chemistry O-level at seven years and one month. Mm -hmm. And this made him the youngest person ever to pass an O-level in history, anywhere. So I didn't really respond until quite late. Uh, the, the, perhaps, if, if you look back on his history, he's advanced so much and he's come so far, but I think that if we had been, uh, I had been more responsive earlier, he would have come further. And if Singapore hadn't delayed us 22 months, he would have gone further. Mm -hmm. So actually there are delays in there. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it might be remarkable to people to think about it, that this situation is actually delayed. But actually, he's delayed, at least by two or three years. He would have been further ahead. Is Aining ability inherited from his parents? Yeah. He doesn't think that. He doesn't know. The funny thing is, he, he developed an interest in chemistry at six. Actually, five. He actually asked for a Christmas tree book. And we had hours and hours of frustration because I don't know what he's talking about. And we assume because five. it's December, it's Christmas tree book. And it's actually a chemistry book that he wanted. So he's asking <laughs> for a chemistry book. So are there any pressure on you as parents of a child prodigy, actually? Um. Well, the pressure on me is to make sure that he's, besides just academics, that he's okay as uh, psychologically, emotionally mm -hmm. intact as a boy, human being. And, uh, yeah. I think he's very lucky he's got two younger brothers. Uh, we moved to from a house to a condo so that, you know, he'll be with, be with other kids. He's got other activities with his age group. So to me, that's 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 the pressure and that's the challenge. Uh, um, but, well, I think the thing we're trying our best. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the other challenge is that um, Sometimes the resources he would need are beyond our, our ability to meet. So there's there's a pressure on us in we have to strive to meet what he needs, and yet we may not have the capacity to meet those those needs, which is difficult. For instance, in Singapore, when we couldn't find lab space, mm -hmm. the gifted education program actually told us, "Why don't you pay for it yourself?" This they, they told us, "You pay for it." That's what they said. So we went scouting around for classes, and we got quotes back like six hundred mm -hmm. Singapore dollars an hour. This is the sort of thing that private school told us. Now we can't afford six hundred dollars an hour for for, for private private lab right. classes. Yeah. So it, it was beyond our means. So there is a there is a psychological and financial pressure of we have to meet this this need, but we don't have the, the ability to meet that need. From my from my observations of him, he seems to be um, mm -hmm. um, better suited to this environment than any previous environment, mm -hmm. and um, seems to be getting more out of it. Yeah. He's growing more. Okay. Is it is it uh, challenging enough for for you? Yeah. Well, the workload is. The work, workload is. Yeah. In what sense is it not then? How do we see you thinking. coming back with homework thinking? Yeah. So not enough thinking. I think thinking you can do. So the workload is challenging, but the thinking is not. There's a lot of assignments stuff. Yeah. Like so he's saying there's a lot of work, but the thinking level he could actually ha handle the higher level. And so, uh, what is it that he's studying at uh, the university now? Um, he studied so far. He studied um, in all in all his all these institutions. He studied if you, um, physics, chemistry, biology, 
mathematics, which is mainly calculus, um, economics, history, theater, English, computer programming, computer animation, and now music, and interpersonal communication, which is something I thought you should study. Um, well, that's what he said. There's, there's obviously a workload involved, but um, um, the thinking level is not... I mean, he could think at a higher level, um, but the workload is, is there. Um, I think it's good because um, the problem with many gifted children is they become lazy. Because if a gifted child is in an ordinary classroom with their age, age mates, the work is too easy for them. So they get into the habit of not working, not trying. But with him, I've put him in a situation whereby there is a workload and he has to do it. So it's, it, it entrains in him the habit of actually working. Whereas if he was in an age, age, age lockstep classroom with, with other people his own age, he, he would be A, very bored, and B, would be trained to be lazy because he wouldn't have to try. He wouldn't have to try to, to be able to, to cope with the situation. So I think it's good. Uh, gift the child should be in a situation whereby they actually have to work. Because if they don't, um, they're going to give up trying. And that's bad. Would, wouldn't he be better served if he goes abroad, for example, back in England or somewhere? Because we're not known for education, education excellence. Um, we wanted a place which is near Shader's family. They're based mainly in Singapore. And, um, um, also they were opening arms here, whereas where we were, the, the doors were closed. So it was an easy decision to make. Um, back in the UK, um, I investigated the UK, but uh, I didn't like the fact that the British education system has only one subject at university. I don't want him to be stuck in one subject. So three years of doing just chemistry would have been the alternative. And I think that's a mistake because he's too young to specialize that much. So I wanted the American system because it gives him a broader, a broader education. I don't want him to be boxed into a little corner. So I, I didn't want to do the British system because of that. And also Britain uh, changed the, the rules about uh, children going to university before we decided to look at the situation. They changed the rules so that any institution in, in, in England that wants to take a child under 17 has to vet all the staff for their suitability to work with children. And this means background checks on every single staff member. And no university, as far as I was aware, aware at the time, was willing to do this. Why is that um, That's what they wanted. They had to do background checks on all their staff if they're going to work with a child under 17. So basically, basically there, there weren't any possibilities there because of this new rule. Um, well, the, the opportunity opens up here, so yeah. we thought it's not far from Singapore. What we'd like, though, because um, there's no four-year American degree program in, in, in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. What we'd like is to, for there to be the option for him to do a four-year program in mathematics, computing, chemistry, and music. So if there's any uh, university out there that wants to expand and actually do a four-year program in Malaysia, we'll be very happy because we'd like to stay here. Um, because we'd only move if we can't get the, the education he needs, because um, we like it here. Um, at least some of those subjects, maybe mathematics, computing, and chemistry, maybe not music, maybe we can carry on doing music at home. Um, but uh, at the very least, a four-year program in the subject areas. So Malaysia might not be known for their educational uh, but it's a warm, it's a warm country. I think it's quite important for a child prodigy. You don't want somewhere where um, there is a mentality where. Uh, what do you call it? Yes, he, he has been welcomed. We do want to emphasize the fact that if any American university wants to extend their full program here, to a that four year would be program, that would be great because he would be their leading student if they give him a chance.